here to cheer you up. Because it's possible you just might need cheering up, I don't know. Um, but I, seriously, the, the reason, I'm not going to talk about uh, the election, I promise. But I will just say this one thing, which is that uh, uh, a lot of the discourse on both sides was dominated by pessimism. It was dominated by worries about how much worse that the world is getting. Uh, and, uh, I, you know, I just don't think that's justified. I think there's every reason to think that, that the future is very bright for young people in particular uh, in the decades. Okay. Woody Allen once said that mankind stands at a crossroads. One path leads to despair and utter hopelessness, the other to total extinction. <laughs> and we must make the right choice. And all too often that's the way people talk about the future. They don't talk about the, the, the wonderful possibilities of the future. So I want to just uh, run through some examples. But first of all, just to remind you how pessimistic people are, this is a recent uh, poll uh, of different countries. And what is it? 6% of, of Americans uh, think the world uh, is getting better. Uh, and 65% think it's getting worse. Uh, in my country, it's even worse. There's only 4% think it's getting better. The only country in which people think the world is getting better more than they think it's getting worse is China. Um, uh, and if you ask people, um, has uh, the proportion of people living in extreme poverty in the world gone up or down? Most people think it's gone up. In fact, the true answer, which only 5% of people get if you ask them in a poll, is that the number of people, the proportion of the world living in extreme poverty has halved over that period. Uh, so people are way too pessimistic in their understanding of the way the world is. So I want to just, first of all, cheer you up a bit by reminding you how much better off you are. This is world uh, GDP, uh, the, the world gross product, so the, the um, the value of the goods and services uh, in the world, uh, in, produced in the world in each year. Uh, corrected for inflation, so this is real, and it's, it's gone up steadily. And there was one year since the Second World War when the uh, world economy shrank, uh, 2009. Actually, we now think it didn't shrink in that year, that was preliminary data, the IMF has corrected that. That, unfortunately, was the year in which I chose to write a book called The Rational Optimist, <laughs> which wasn't perhaps uh, great timing. But look what's happened since. We're completely back on track, uh, steaming ahead um, again on the, exactly the same trajectory we're on. The world economy is improving all the time. The value of goods and services available to people is going up. And if you correct it for population, world GDP per capita, and you go back 500 years, you can see just how extraordinary this phenomenon is how recent it is, how it's something that just only in the last few generations we've been able to experience this sort of leap ahead in, in human living standards. Now, we reckon that's all to do with something called the Industrial Revolution, when we started, we discovered the trick of how to generate economic growth on a, on a rapid scale, but you know, we reckon that started in the middle of the 18th century. You can't see it on the chart, though, can you? There's no sign of this great leap forward in human living standards at that point. It comes much later, it's a much more gradual phenomenon. And it's not just that the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting less poor. As I say, the number of people living in extreme poverty on, a, on $2 a day was more than half the world when I was born. And now it's less than 10%. That is an incredible change uh, in one lifetime. Uh, and something to be enormously celebrated. And that number is heading for zero. Now there's a heck of a lot of poverty above that level. In other words, it's, it's possible to be extremely poor on three, four, five dollars a, a day. Uh, but still, you know, we are making good progress. But some, you know, these numbers in dollars don't really capture what's happened to us, what, what improvements have been in life, because they don't take into account some of the <coughs> convenience improvements we've got from technology. So I, I find it useful to ask you yourselves this question. How much, how long do you have to work to earn enough money to buy a certain thing. And let's take light. You want to switch on uh, an 80 watt compact, compact fluorescent bulb for an hour in order to read a book tonight, preferably my book. And uh, how long do you have to work if you're on the average wage to be able to turn on that light for that length of time? And the answer is about half a second. Actually, that, this calculation done by William Nordhaus was in the 1990s, so it's probably a quarter of a second on that. But anyway, let's say half a second work to get you one hour of light, which is a pretty good deal. Your grandparents had to work for about uh, eight seconds to get that much uh, light. Uh, 
which means that you've got seven and a half seconds that they didn't have to do something else, to fulfill another need, to give yourself another uh, uh, advantage. Um, that's what economic growth is, I think. It's a shrinking the amount of time it takes to fulfill a need. And back in 1880, you'd have had to work for 15 minutes on the average wage then to earn enough money to fuel a kerosene lamp for long enough to give you the same amount of light. That's quite a significant investment of work, 15 minutes to get one hour of light. And in 1800, the average person would have had to work for six hours to be able to afford a candle that could produce that much light. That, to me, captures just what an extraordinary change we've lived through during that time. I mean, you know, people have been well off in the past. Um, uh, king Louis XIV, the son of King of France in the 17th century, was uh, extremely well off. Um, and one of the ways in which he was well off was he had lots of people to do things for him. He had 498 people to prepare his dinner every night. But you've got 498 people to prepare your dinner every night, each one of you today. They're working in restaurants and bistros and cafes, and none of them knows who's going to serve you, and they're going to serve other people too, but, you know, at very short notice, they're able to prepare a really good meal, probably less likely to have salmonella in it than his dinner. Uh, and so this, this is the magic of what we've been able to achieve. We've been able to give everybody uh, the lifestyle of king, not everybody, but an enormous number of people the lifestyle of king. Joseph Schumpeter said, capitalist experience. Capitalist achievement does not typically consist in providing more silk stockings for queens, but in bringing them within the reach of factory girls. So, we're better off, but are we healthier, happier, cleverer, cleaner, freer, more peaceful, and more equal? Uh, and the answer is yes. Every one of those adjectives is true. Healthier, this is child mortality, <coughs> plummeting all over the world, the greatest measure of misery anybody can think of. Now, Africa lagged behind the rest of the world in the 1980s and 1990s, in particular largely because of the AIDS epidemic. Uh, child mortality stagnated, as it were, in, in, in that conflict, but it's now catching up. Uh, and so on all continents, that measure of health is improved. Malaria, um, one of the greatest scourges, uh, uh, still one of the greatest scourges, but we were, we were told that malaria would get worse in this century because of climate change. Well, so far, in the first 15 years of this century, we've halved malaria mortality globally. That's incredible. A lot of the credit for that goes to impregnated um, bed nets, uh, and the Gates Foundation has, has played a large part in that. What about happiness? Most people used to think that as you got richer, you got less happy, not more happy. Um, and indeed, this was known as the Easterlin paradox, because uh, Professor Easterlin had discovered it. But it turned out his data was faulty, and now we've got more and better data. We know that actually, on the whole, on average, it, it, other things are equal, uh, the more money people have, the happier they are, both between countries, within countries, and within lifetimes, there's a correlation between wealth and happiness. It's not a perfect correlation, and it's possible to be very rich and very unhappy, but that's all right, because it cheers up other people. <laughs> Um, your probability of dying as a result of a drought, flood, or storm is some 90% less than it was in the 1920s globally. Not because weather's got less dangerous, but because transport and shelter and communication have gone so much better. Um, and the amount of food available per head has gone steadily up on all continents. So in a period when we've doubled the world population, we've increased the amount of food available per person during that time. Literacy rates are converging on 100% all around the world. Uh, the amount of oil spilled in the ocean down by 90% since the 1970s, since I was young. These are, these are statistics that nobody ever tells you about. You know, they, when things are getting better, they just drop out of the news and you never hear about them. One of my favorite ones that's just been properly published for the first time this year is the phenomenon of global greening. greening. Uh, we have added uh, uh, roughly 15% of the world's green vegetation over the last 30 years, as this NASA uh, study has shown. Uh, and most of the reason for that is because of the extra carbon dioxide in the air, plants are able to grow better, particularly in, in drier areas. So, as the lead author on the study put it, it's like we've added a continent twice the size of the mainland USA in terms of green vegetation in one generation. Um, violence is... <coughs> You know, we're less nasty to each other. Stephen Pinker wrote a whole book about this, uh, 
and you know, most people think it's getting worse. Sure, there's a lot of terrible things happen, but in terms of assaults and rapes and things like that, the trend is in the right direction. Um, well, well, on the whole, more free, more of us live in democracies now than we used to. That trend is probably going in the wrong direction at the moment. Places like Russia and, and so on are slipping backwards towards uh, autocracy. Um, but the general trend has been in the right direction. And the number of people killed in warfare uh, has been coming down pretty dramatically. Uh, in the first decade of this century, fewer people died in battle than in any decade since records began. Now, I suspect the decade we're living through at the moment is not going to be so good because of the Syrian war. Um, but other places, other parts of the world where, where bad wars have been happening, like Africa, have actually improved in that respect. The one that surprises most people is <coughs> equality. The world is getting more equal. You often hear that inequality is getting worse, equality is declining. It's not true globally, because people in poor countries are getting rich faster than people in rich countries, and so there is a general convergence. Back in the 60s, 70s, there was a great big valley between the peaks of the rich countries and the poor countries. You can see it clearly there. But today, there is a convergence towards the middle. That on the whole, uh, there are many fewer people at the poor end of the graph, as I've mentioned already, and not a lot more people at the rich end of the graph, but a huge number more in the middle of the chart. All of this has been made possible by the harnessing of energy. Uh, it's no, no point in denying that we couldn't do this without huge amounts of energy, because energy is what amplifies work, what enables people to uh, be hugely more productive. And 87% of that energy still comes from fossil fuels, uh, and that proportion has, hasn't really changed in the last 10 years, despite efforts to change it. But where does this come from? What is innovation? Well, you know, why, why does it happen to us and not to rabbits or rocks? You know, prosperity isn't something that other animals experience. Um, uh, and I think that this is what I try and grapple with in both rational optimist and also in the evolution of everything. And I think it takes us right back to an understanding of what economics is, what markets are, and what technology is all about. On my desk at home sits this object. It's a, a Schwabian hand axe from half a million years ago of the kind used by Homo erectus. Uh, my wife bought it for me on eBay. Um, and <laughs> right next to it is an object of exactly the same size and shape which is rather wonderful, I think. It's not a fake photograph, it's the only doctrine I've done to this photograph is to remove the logo from the mouse, because I don't see why I should be free advertising it. Um, uh, they, they are exactly the same size and shape. It's, it's truly uncanny. And I find this spooky, because it, it tells you that half a million years separates me from the man who used that axe, and yet, you know, he must have had the same feeling of an object in, in his hand. But it's the differences, of course, that are most interesting. Because when the Australian hand axe was made, it was a technology that was used all over the world, and it was a technology that had been used for about a million years without really any change at all. That's a bizarre idea. It's almost impossible to get your head around the idea of a technology going on for being used for 30,000 generations with no innovation. And yet that's what's happened. It appears that Homo erectus had technology, but he did not have innovation. <clears throat> he literally hadn't invented innovation. So in a sense, it's probably true that the hand axe was, a, was an instinctive thing. Making these things was an instinct, just like making a bird's nest is an instinct for a bird. Um, that's a strange idea too, but it's, it, it, it's the best explanation we've got. Nowadays, of course, that mouse is already obsolete. I no longer use it, I use a laptop instead. We change our technology all the time. And I think the secret lies in the fact that everything, it, the technology is now a totally complex thing. It's a thing that comes from uh, combining and recombining different technologies. So that mouse has lots of different materials in it. It has plastic and metal and silicon, and it has lots of different ideas. Ideas that occur to different people in different times, in different places, people who live thousands of miles apart, people who live hundreds of years before each other. These ideas are all combined in that one thing, and that's true of all our technologies. Brian Arthur has argued that there is no technology we possess today that is not a combination
foundation of other technologies. Now, at some deep-rooted sense, that must be wrong. There must originally have been a, an individual technology, but the way we make new technologies is by combining and recombining technologies in different ways. Uh, and what that enables us to do is to draw upon the ideas of other people uh, and thereby magnify the amount of ingenuity we can draw. Um, so, for example, this mouse uh, was made for me um, by lots of other people. They were, without knowing it, they were working for me. Um, there, and there were lots and lots of them. There was someone drilling an oil, work, uh, sorry, someone growing coffee in Brazil whose, whose coffee was going to be drunk on an oil rig, whose oil was going to be used in a, in a plastics factory. They were all contributing to the manufacture of this one object uh, for little old me. And um, there were literally thousands and thousands of them. And I find that a really magical thought. That in a sense, what we're doing is we're all working for each other. And the grand story of human history the difference between those two objects lies in the fact that we went from self-sufficiency where you made your own, you produced yeah. your own consumption. We moved away from that to where we got more and more specialized in what we produced, but more and more diversified in what we could consume. That's the grand theme of human history, in my view. And, the, and to the extent that we go in that direction, we get more prosperous, and to the extent we go backwards, we don't. Self-sufficiency is, in effect, another word for poverty. So, as I say, we re combine and recombine different ideas to, to get new ideas. This is my favorite example of how a technology is made from different technologies. It's called the pill camera. It takes a picture of your insides if you swallow it. And it came about after a conversation between a gastroenterologist and a guided missile designer. That's what I mean by ideas having sex. <laughs> And this only became possible in human uh, history because of our habit of exchange, our, our almost obsessive tendency to swap, to say, I've got something that I, I've got something that, that, that I don't need all of, you've got something you don't need all of, let's exchange, and we're both better off. Uh, this habit, what Adam Smith called truck, barter, and exchange, which is universal to human beings and whenever we make contact with early with, with uh, hunter-gatherers in, in New Guinea or uh, parts of North America when they were first white people got here etc there was immediate ability to trade uh, because it, it was it was something that all human beings do as Adam Smith famously put it uh, no man ever saw a dog make fair and deliberate exchange of a bone with another dog then this was something that Neanderthal people didn't do. They had huge brains, possibly bigger than ours. They were very clever as individuals. But what they didn't do, as far as we can tell, was exchange and specialize in the same way. So, for example, at a site in the Caucasus, where Neanderthal remains are found and tools are found, those tools are only made from local material. As soon as modern humans move in, you start finding material from a long distance away. What this tells you is that trade has started, uh, and with trade comes the ability to get goods from a long way away, and therefore to get ideas from a long way away too. So the secret of human society is when we effectively networked our brains, when we started using the cloud, when we started sharing and cooperating our knowledge, not when we just became clever as individuals. The internet, which is this is a sort of image of, uh, is in effect just the expression of something we've been doing all along uh, and a rather more efficient expression of it. You can see what happens if you give up on exchange uh, networks by some natural experiments. Tasmania became an island 10,000 years ago when sea levels rose and it was cut off from Australia. The people living on Tasmania then not only didn't get access to technologies invented in Australia after that period, for example, the boomerang was invented after that, so the Tasmanians never got it, but actually gave up some of the technologies they already had. They simplified their technology over the next 10,000 years. It was a very small population of hunter-gatherers on the island, about 4,000 on average. That's not enough to maintain the specialization that you need to keep certain technologies go. So they actually gave up uh, bone tools, for example, uh, by the time uh, uh, that they were uh, of, of 
right of century contact, they'd given up a whole string of technologies that they'd had before. And this is true of other isolated human populations, like the Andaman Islands and so on, that you get a simplification of technology uh, when you get isolated. So this shows how innovation, invention, is a network effect. It's not about individual and such. There's nothing wrong with the Tasmanians' brains as individuals. It was the fact that they didn't have a big enough collective brain to keep this going. The same is not true of Tirol Fuego, despite it being an equally hospitable, in an inhospitable island of roughly the same size. Um, uh, Tirol Fuego had bows and arrows and all sorts of technologies invented over the last 10,000 years. Uh, uh, why? Because the Magellan Strait is quite narrow, where the Bass Strait is quite wide, and so there was trading contact and the Fuegians had access to a <coughs> collective brain the size of South America. Now, this led me in my most recent book, The Evolution of Everything, uh, to begin to think about how technology changes over time, but also about how culture changes over time and how ideas change over time. And to see it really in evolutionary terms, to see it as something that happens gradually, that happens incrementally, that happens by a, a form of natural selection, like called trial and error. Uh, and I think this is a very um, interesting way of, of understanding what happens. Because when you think about it, human society includes a lot of things that are quite difficult to categorize. It was this Scottish philosopher, Adam Ferguson, who I think put it best in 1767 when he said there are things that are the result of human action, but not the execution of any human desire. What he meant by that was something like the English language. The English language is obviously a man-made thing. It's not a natural phenomenon like a thunderstorm. And it's got huge complexity great fit between form and function and all sorts of rules. It's a beautiful machine for communication. But it's a machine without a designer. There was nobody who invented, there wasn't an inventor of the English language, there isn't a director general of the English language, there isn't a central committee of the English language, there isn't a supreme court of the English language. So how do we enforce these rules? How do we ensure that this extraordinary complexity is there? Why? Who designed it? How did it come into being? And of course the answer is it evolved. It emerged from the, from the communication of individual people. So I'm not reading on English here, I'm talking about any language, if you like, but it's, it, it, the, the, the complexity and fit between form and function of a language comes about in a bottom-up way through the interaction of individuals. And the same is true for the internet. The internet is, is something that wasn't really invented. It emerged from the way people communicated with each other on computers. Uh, it has all sorts of uh, uh, regularities and rules and functional uh, aspects to it, but most of these were not imposed on it. You could say that certain inventions have, were, were important for the invention of the internet, packet switching, or, uh, the World Wide Web, and things like that were invented by individual people, but the, uh, these were only very small parts of the story. Uh, and when you think about it, this is true of lots of other things too. Government is something that is quite complicated and has all sorts of features. Uh, and, but if you go back and look at the history of them, they kind of emerge gradually from uh, um, the way people uh, interact with each other rather than get invented at particular points. Uh, uh, morality, Adam Smith wrote a whole book making this point theory of moral sentiments, that morality is something that emerges from the way we, we, we calibrate our behavior against that of other people to work out what we decide is acceptable and what is not acceptable. And then we then teach it back to ourselves as if we've, as if we've invented it as an idea. So this phenomenon, this things that are the result of human action but not the execution of any human design, seems to be a very fruitful way uh, of looking at much of and it is, of course, reminiscent of evolution by natural selection. Because a rainforest is like that too. Uh, it is an extraordinary complicated ecosystem in which each species has its own place and each body has its own organs and each organ has its own organelles and cells and organelles and each organelle has its own uh, 
molecules, etc. And all of this is incredibly beautiful fit between form and function. But we now, on the whole, accept uh, most of us, at least, uh, since Charles Darwin, that this came about in a in a bottom-up fashion without a, without a designer. And when you look at human artifacts, they do evolve in this incremental, gradual way without really much in the way of step changes. So this is a beautiful paper about the uh, history of the hole in the middle of a violin, uh, which has gradually changed shape over time from a round hole to this F-shaped hole, which um, is the right thing to do in terms of making the, the sound better. Uh, and it turns out that if you look at the history of this, you don't have brilliant people suddenly saying, oh, I'm going to change the shape of the hole. You get sort of gradual mistakes along the way, which get, some of which get incorporated and some of which don't. It's a sort of trial and error process. Indeed, even objects that clearly are designed turn out to, in a sense, evolve as well. I mean, what could be more obviously designed than a boat? A boat has to be built by a boat builder to a design, which he's got in his head beforehand that it's going to be a certain shape and a certain size and a certain, made of certain material and so on. But a French philosopher named Emile, Chant 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 Emile Chartier, uh, uh, otherwise known as Alain, made the argument that actually, when you think about it, a boat evolves too, because <coughs> every boat is copied from another boat. So let's reason as follows in the manner of Darwin. It's clear that a very badly made boat will end up at the bottom. After one of the voyages, it must never be copied. One could then say with complete rigor that it is the sea herself which fashions the boats, choosing those that function and describe the others. I think it's a rather lovely way of looking. There's another feature of the history of technology that looks very like evolution too, and that is that, that there's a huge amount of trial and error, a huge amount of natural selection. Uh, this is Art Fry, the inventor of the post-it note making the point, but you find this wherever you go, whenever you talk to inventors, they always talk about the importance of trial and error. It's important to have lots of ideas and keep some. It's not a matter of one brilliant person in an ivory tower having a stroke of genius. It's a matter of lots of people trying different things, some of them working and some of them not working. And then it leads to the slightly startling idea that progress in technology is inextricable we might not be able to stop it even if we wanted to. Um, look at Moore's law, for example. Moore's law is the idea that every 18 months the power of, uh, of computing roughly doubles, uh, or the cost of computing roughly halves, if you like. Uh, 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 and Gordon Moore noticed this in the 1960s, uh, and it was true, it's been true pretty well ever since, and it's, it's about to run out of rare uh, chips and to the point where we can't miniaturize things much further. But what Ray Kurzweil noticed, which is what this chart, where this chart comes from, is that actually Moore's law was true even if you take into account previous technologies. So for example, from the vacuum tube to the transistor, there's a gradual, not a sudden change. And this is very odd when you think about it, because you know, we think that an invention of a, of a of a new technology would lead to a step change, but it doesn't. It just gradually continues to improve in this in this steady march. And now we understand Moore's law. How come we can't jump ahead? And the answer is because we need each technology to be able to get to the next step of the technology. So there's a sort of inexorable inevitability about the way these things happen. And you can see this also in the phenomenon of simultaneous invention. Um, uh, who invented the light? Thomas Edison, right? Wrong. I come from Newcastle all the time, and a man there called Joseph Swan invented the light bulb. Except if I was from Russia, I would say that Lodigin invented the light bulb. And if I was from Paris, I'd say that Maxime invented the light bulb. And they'd all be right. Because actually, there were 23 different people who came up with the design for the incandescent light bulb in different countries, totally independently, in the same decade. <coughs> Thomas Edison just happened to end up scooping the pool commercially. But what this is telling you is that that technology was right, was ready to happen at that stage. The various combinations of things that you needed to bring together, electricity, 
vacuum, glass, all these things were, were kind of ready to be combined. And it was inevitable that someone would invent the light bulb around the time that they did. So you can shoot 23 of those people uh, before they've invented the light bulb and you don't change history because someone else would have come up with it. And, when you, and this is true of pretty well every technology you go and look at the history of. The thermometer, algebra, logarithms, you know, there's, 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 a, there's a dispute over who invented them. The calculus, Leibniz and Newton had a furious row about who got there first. Evolution itself, of course, Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace came up with it at the same time, etc., um, uh, etc. Et um, uh, even special relativity, which you think of as uniquely Einstein's <coughs> brilliant insight, nobody really thinks that if Einstein had been run over by a tram before he discovered it, that we wouldn't understand special relativity to this day. We know that Hendrik Lorentz would have got there within a few years. So there's something. I mean, this is a slightly rude idea of mine because it means that all these great inventors and scientists are taken down a peck and told that they're completely dispensable uh, and that if, if they hadn't existed, we'd still have their inventions and their discovery. But I, I say, well, no, it's even more impressive that you got there because you were in a race to get there against somebody else. This is not true, by the way, of art. You know, if, if, if Shakespeare doesn't live, Hamlet doesn't get written. If Mozart doesn't live, his concertos don't get written, etc. So I think there is a there's a distinction there between art and science, um, but this phenomenon of simultaneous invention implies to me that there's a sort of unstoppability about technological progress, which will guarantee improvements in our living standards in the future, whether we do anything about it or not. Google's a brilliant example. Of this. I mean, does anyone seriously think that if if Google hadn't being formed as a company, if Larry Page had never met Sergey Brin, that we would not have search engines today? Of course we would. In fact, there were scores of search engines already in the market when, when uh, uh, Google came together. I think the search engine is probably one of the most me momentous inventions of my lifetime. And most of you in this room probably can't remember a world where one couldn't look anything up at the drop of a hat. I think it's a wonderful um, new uh, aspect of our lives. This brings me back to my favorite image two objects because um, I said that a huge number of people were involved in the making of the computer mouse but there's something rather peculiar about it which is that among those millions of people not one of them knows how to make a computer mouse there's nobody on the planet who knows how to make that object quite literally the man who runs the computer mouse company doesn't know, he just knows how to run a company. The person working on the assembly line doesn't know because they don't know how to drill an oil well to get oil to make it into to make it into plastic and so on. This was rather beautifully illustrated by some artists recently who tried to set out to make everyday objects from scratch, you know, by uh, one of them wanted to make a toaster and he, he, his plan was to, to get iron ore out of the ground and etc. etc. It took him about a year and a half and a huge amount of money and he produced a really bad toaster. <laughs> um, I'm actually only, of course, quoting from a very famous and wonderful essay called I Pencil, uh, written by Leonard Reed in the 1950s, which is a, uh, a pencil trying to discover how it came to be, and discovering that although millions of people contributed to its manufacture, not one of them knew how to make it. Because the knowledge isn't stored in brains, it's stored between brains. And, and that, again, makes a sort of inevitability about what happens in, in technological change. In 1907, a 85-year-old uh, statistician by the name of Francis Galton uh, went to a country show in the West of England, the West of England Fat Stock and Poultry Competition uh, uh, Exhibition, it was called. Um, and there was a competition there to guess the weight of an ox. Uh, and there were 800 entries. You had to pay six months to enter. You had to fill out a card. And I think it was a sort of sweepstake, whoever uh, uh, got the right answer got all the money. And Galton said, can I borrow the cards after you've finished? Because I want to uh, do some analysis of them. And somebody has since reanalyzed the data uh, by looking at Galton's original notes. Uh, and the data is actually even more impressive than Galton thought. But what, what he realized was that the average of all the guesses 
He rejected um, uh, 13, so there were 787 uh, guesses as the weight of the ox. The average was 1,197 pounds. Actual weight of the ox was 1,197 pounds. So in other words, I mean, this crowd, you know, was a crowd of ordinary, some people were way out, some people thought the ox was twice as heavy as that, some people thought it was half as heavy as that. But the point is the crowd had a surprising wisdom about it. The crowd was able to um, be more accurate. Well, there was one guy, apparently, who guessed it correctly. So there was, the, 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 but, but the, the crowd can be better than an expert. You know? uh, and this is, of course, the whole concept behind democracy. That in the end, you know, should Britain leave the European Union? or not, we were asked earlier this year. And we decided that instead of relying on experts to tell us what the answer is, we would ask 34 million Brits to vote. 17.4 million of them said yes, we should. And 16.1 said no, we should. Um, uh, but in a way, this is what the market does every day. Uh, I mean, I worked out the other day that about 10 million people eat lunch in London there's about 8 million people in London, about 2 million people come in every day to, to work. 10 million lunches, very few of those 10 million will decide in advance what they're going to eat. They're going to eat, they're going to decide at the last minute. So how on earth do we know how much beef, pork, fish, vegetables to make available for Londoners for their lunch? Uh, I mean, there's a guy called the London Lunch Commissioner. He's extremely highly paid. He's got a huge staff, and he works this out every day. He does a really good. No, there isn't. Of course, there isn't. <laughs> I mean, it's it's a silly idea, and yet, of course, that's how now North Korea tries to run its economy, or Venezuela tries to run its economy. The, the, the market sends these signals of supply and demand that is, in effect, a version of the wisdom of crowds. Uh, this idea, uh, the same idea, uh, which enables us to ensure that nobody goes hungry at lunchtime in London every day, day after day. Ten million people. How is it? It's an extraordinary achievement. So, I've given you some reasons why I think the world is getting better. The trajectory is in the right direction. Innovation and technology, which is what's providing these improvements in our lifestyle, has a, has a, has a long way to go and is, is, is still heading in the right direction. And we can't stop it even if we want to. But can this go on? Or am I like the person who falls out of a skyscraper and says, so far so good, as he crosses the second story? Um, I don't think so. I think we've got every reason to think that many of the ecological problems we're facing is actually going to get, get better uh, rather than worse in this century. I mean, when I was young, we were told tremendously pessimistic things about the future, about the future that is now. Uh, how the world would look by the early 21st century. Uh, the population explosion would be unstoppable, global famine would be inevitable, crop yields would fall, cancer epidemic caused by pesticides would shorten our lives, the desert would advance to two miles away, rainforests would disappear, the plastic rain would destroy forests, oil spills would worsen, oil and gas would run out, so would copper, zinc, chrome, and many other natural resources. The Great Lakes would die, dozens of birds and mammal species would go extinct every year, and the new ice age was about to begin. Every single one of these was, you know, headlined in newspapers when I was a student. And nobody was going around saying it's all nonsense. I mean, they were taken very seriously, and every single one was wrong. Now, in some cases, it's wrong because we did something about it, and we averted the threat. In some cases, it's wrong because, well, the jury's out. We might not yet have, have uh, found out, but mostly it was wrong because it was grotesquely exaggerated. Uh, the, the threats of these things were overdone. So when uh, part of the reason I wrote this book was so that young people didn't have to listen to this kind of litany again in every generation without some antidote at least. Um, for, take world population, which was the, the, the big worry when I was young. The world population growth rate has halved in my the absolute number of people added to the world population is going down, has been going down now for 30 years. Uh, and uh, on its the, the world population quadrupled in the 20th century, it's not even going to double in the 21st century. Uh, on its present trajectory, uh, the median variant of the UN says that it will stop growing altogether by the end of this century. So uh, whether, uh, yes, there's still, it's still going to be a problem making sure there's enough food for 9, 10, perhaps even 11 billion people, 
but it's not as big a problem as we faced in the last century. And the amount of land we need to produce the food that people need is actually going down. It's down by 68% since 1960, average of overall crops, the amount of land you need to produce a given amount of food. So it's actually getting easier to find the land to feed people. And I suspect we're going to need quite a lot less land in 2050 to feed 9 billion people than we needed in 2000 to feed 6 billion. Species extinction is a huge problem, uh, but it's peaked by the look of it. It was at its worst quite a while ago, and it's nothing like the predictions that were made. Dylan Ripley, a famous conservationist, said that by 1995, 75 to 80 percent of all species would be gone. Uh, Paul and Anne Ehrlich said 50 percent gone by 2005. Thomas Lovejoy said 15 to 20 percent by 2000. Much more modest number. What's the true number? Well, for birds and mammals, which are the only ones we know well enough to, to know, um, we've lost 1.3% of mammals and 1.4% of birds. Well, what about climate change? Because that's the big worry today. And I'm not going to say a huge amount about this, but I'm just going to try and persuade you that yes, it's a real issue, but no, it's not likely to be uh, as bad as a lot of people say. The temperature has certainly gone up over the last 30, 40 years by about 0.15 degrees per decade if you use the surface temperature data set, about 0.12 if you use the uh, uh, satellite data set. That's less than half as fast as expected in the, in the 1990 Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report. It predicted 0.3 degrees per decade. So we are seeing increases, but not nearly as fast as the models have been assuming. Uh, in temperature. And we're seeing very little change in, in the frequency or intensity of storms, <coughs> the frequency or intensity of droughts, the change in the amount of snow cover in the northern hemisphere. Um, we're seeing a decrease in the uh, Arctic sea ice, but not in Antarctic sea ice, which is an increase in Antarctic sea ice. Um, and sea level is continuing to rise, but there's no sign of any dramatic acceleration. It's going up at a rate of about a foot per century. Greenland is maybe losing two gigatons of ice a year, but that's 1% per century, which is not a huge amount. Um, so, and by the way, in terms of what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change predicts, it gives four scenarios for what might happen, ranging from uh, one that's pretty harmless to one that's catastrophic. Uh, but if you look at the economic predictions behind those, you find that in all of them, GDP per capita increases during the century. So this catastrophe is still going to leave us richer, according to these predictions. Indeed, the warmest one, um, sorry, the, the coolest one, uh, actually leaves us uh, 16 times richer um, uh, than, uh, than we are today the end of this century per capita, which is an extraordinary idea. The idea that um, the average wealth of the average citizen would be 16 times as much as today. So I'm a lukewarm. That's the um, term for people who think that we have seen far too much polarization in this debate between, on the one hand, people who say that climate change is real and dangerous, uh, and on the other hand, people who say that um, it's not happening at all, it's a hoax. Um, it's obvious, isn't it, that there should be at least a third possibility, if not more, um, which is that climate change is real but not very dangerous. And what bothers me is that a lot of the policies we're adopting to combat climate change are actually uh, doing real harm uh, to poor people and to the environment. This is a cartoon uh, making a pointed point about the ethanol programs which convert uh, basically food into fuel and put upward pressure on food prices and uh, pressure on habitats and so on. Well, where does this all end? What happens next? Um, because it's all very well saying things have gone fine till now, but what, what does the future look like? Well, the first thing to say is that I shouldn't be believed if I say anything about the future, because uh, people are notoriously bad at saying anything. And I have no idea what's going to happen. Nonetheless, I do think 
that there are things happening today that are going to make an enormous difference to the way we live and that, that presage changes that we can barely imagine. And this is one of them. This is blockchain, the technology behind Bitcoin. I don't necessarily think Bitcoin is about to sort of suddenly replace all currencies, and I admit that at the moment it's mostly something used by drug dealers. Um, but I do think that the technology behind it, the concept of the blockchain, the concept of a sort of self-verifying um, uh, thing, uh, I'm getting a bit vague at this point because I don't fully understand it, it, is actually potentially rather intriguing. One of the things I love about it is that it's anonymous. We don't know who Satoshi Nakamoto is. He has a Japanese name, he uses East Coast hours, he has a German web address, he uses British English, um, uh, he, there's an Australian who claims to be him, um, but probably isn't. There's a Californian who I think probably is, but denies it. Um, this is rather magnificent, I think. I love the idea that at last we've got an incredibly important innovation that's totally anonymous. And it is connected, he, if it is who I think it is, he relies on lots of other people um, uh, to, it. it's very much a group effort to produce this idea. Why is it important? Because I think it might disintermediate all sorts of things. It might cut out the middleman. The middleman being, in the case of money, government. It's government that tells you that a dollar is worth a dollar. Um, and in the case of other professions, the law, for example, this could lead to smart contracts. Contracts in which you don't need a lawyer. You don't need an accountant, sorry lawyers or accountants in the audience, but the, there, are, there are extraordinary possibilities here that, that the internet has made possible and that we're only just beginning to understand. So my point is really you ain't seen nothing yet. And I'd like to just end with this quotation. We cannot absolutely prove that those up in error who say society has reached a turning point that we've seen our best day. But so said all who came okay, before us, and with just as much apparent reason. On what principle is it? Nothing but improvement behind us. We do expect nothing but deterioration before us. That's a useful quote to throw at pessimists, I find. But it's not me who said that. It was Thomas Babington Macaulay, the historian, writing in 1830. Already then he was fed up with the pessimists saying it can't get better, it can only get worse. Uh, and then it and it had hardly started getting living standards of Britain were just beginning to inch up as a result of the Industrial Revolution. So, just as the future was extremely bright then, but nobody believed it, so the future is extremely bright now, and very few people believe it. Thank you very much.